Today we're going to dive into an algorithm called Tactical Pathfinding for A-Star. A-Star by itself, of course, is all about finding the shortest path from one point to another. But Tactical Pathfinding tries to balance short travel times while avoiding hostile observation and fire. Tactical Pathfinding not only adds a realistic touch to AI movement, but it also presents a more rewarding and less predictable opponent for the player. So in this video, we're going to extend the standard A-Star algorithm so that it generates tactical paths. Let's get started. I want to start by building a class that will represent the grid. Each cell of our grid can be represented by a struct, and I'm going to call that a node. Just like in a normal A-star pathfinding algorithm, we want each node to represent a vector three position in the world, and maybe some other information about it, such as, is it walkable? Let's take both those values in through a constructor, and we'll default is walkable to false. Now, just to save ourselves some room here, I'm going to move the node struct into its own file. Once that's done, let's come back to the grid manager and start writing some more code. Here, let's expose a few public fields so that we can do a little bit of configuration inside of the editor. Let's have a grid size X and a grid size Z and a default cell size of 1. I've also created a text mesh pro prefab that I'm going to use to show values on every single node inside of the grid. And for some of those nodes, I also want to color them a red color, which will help us visually represent which nodes are actually dangerous to be inside of. Let's also have a 2D array that will store all of the nodes of our grid. And then I'm going to make a dictionary that relates vector three positions to integer values. The integer values are going to represent an eight way directional segment. So we're going to divide each square up into 45 degrees. We're going to use this to track enemy influence coming in from different directions towards the node. Each position will map to one of these eight sector bit masks. We're going to talk about this in detail in a few minutes, but for now it's enough to understand that an integer is 32 bits. If we divide a node up into eight 45 degree sectors, that gives us four bits to store information about each of those 45 degree sections. So let's do some initial setup for our grid. First of all, let's initialize it to the correct size. Then let's create two loops here. We'll loop through the X coordinates and inside we'll loop through all the Z coordinates. Using that, we can compute a world position for the node. Then we can create the node and let's check to make sure that it's actually walkable. Let's have a new method that'll actually check the nav mesh to see if there is a nav mesh surface at that position. To do that, we can just use the position static method. Here I'm going to use the discard placeholder because we don't need a position back. We already know that the grid is flat. If we had a map with variable height, you could use this to get an actual nav mesh hit, which contains a vector three position. Next, let's get into calculating these actual sectors. I'm going to create a new method for this. We're going to need to know all of the threats in our game. For me, I've tagged all of my enemies with a special tag, but you might want to pass them in as a list or something else. We're going to want to check every single node in the grid, but I don't really care about the nodes that I can not actually step onto. For those ones, let's just continue. Now, each node can start with a sector mask with a value of zero. This is going to store the danger levels in all eight directional sectors. Calculate this, we're going to iterate over each of the enemies. Enemies that can move and shoot will have an enemy component. Let's use pattern matching to make sure that they actually have one of those. Each of the enemies has a property detection radius, and we can use that to see if they're actually close enough to this node to be of any influence. We can calculate the direction and then the distance. And we're also going to want to make sure there's nothing obstructing the view between the enemy and this node. In a new method here, we can perform a raycast between the two points. So back up here, we can just continue if the enemy is too far away. We can also just continue if their view is obstructed. Now, if we get past here, we know that the enemy actually has line of sight to this node. Let's figure out the 45 degree angle sector based on the direction that they're looking at the node from. To divide a node up into sectors, we can just use trigonometry. The core function here is ATAN2, which calculates the angle between the given direction vector and the positive x-axis. However, this returns values in the range of negative 180 to 180 degrees, which isn't really ideal for what we want. So to fix this, let's normalize the angle by adding 360, and we'll take the remainder when divided by 360. So this will always give us a value between 0 and 360 degrees. Then we just divide that by 45, and we can map the complete circle into eight evenly spaced sectors from 0 to 7. So that'll split our node up into eight sections, 
but I also want to give them a value based on how close we are to the enemy. All the enemies have a detection radius and we could consider that kind of their max range. If we're closer than 50% of that range, we're in real danger. Let's return a higher value like three. But maybe if we're within 75% of that range, we could return a two. And if we're actually within the max range, we could return one. If we're not in range at all, we would return zero. So with these helpers, let's first of all figure out which sector the enemy is attacking the node from. Then let's calculate exactly how much danger they pose. Right now, our sector mask is a 32-bit integer set to zero. Our sector index determines which of the four bit segments we want to modify. So suppose our sector came back as two, two times four is eight. This tells us that sector two is stored at bit positions eight through 11 from the right. We can get the four bit value currently stored in sector two by bit shifting to the right by eight. Then we can isolate just those four bits that we want by using the AND operator and a binary literal of four ones. Four ones in binary is the same thing as saying 15, means that I don't wanna store values greater than 15 inside of here. So let's add the current value to the range value we got back from our helper method, and we'll take the minimum up to 15. Now, before setting the new value, first let's make sure that we have all zeros in that particular sector. Then we'll use a binary or to actually set our new value into those four bits. Once we've iterated over all the enemies and we have the exact sector mask that we want, Let's set it into our node sector data dictionary. Now I realize this might look really complicated to some people, especially beginners. And of course you can represent this information as a collection of integers as well. The benefit to using a bit mask here and bitwise operations is that it's extremely performant and has an extremely small footprint. All right, I'm gonna collapse that up and let's create a new method that will actually make use of this information. Using the sectors, you can now calculate how much threat is coming from the front or maybe from the back or the sides. But here, maybe we can just calculate the total amount of threat for a node. So we could say for each of the eight sectors, using the same kind of bit math, we can just start tallying up all the danger score and return it. As our algorithm continues to evolve, we can add more methods here to return damage values for specific sectors. Now, to finish up this class, let's have a few more helper methods. One can be just to get the sectors of any given node, and we can have another one to actually draw the grid. This one will be very simple. Let's iterate over all the X and all the Z positions. For each one, let's grab the node. Let's also grab each danger score. If the danger is zero, let's just continue. Otherwise, let's create a quad. Let's make sure that it doesn't have a collider and then let's parent it under this transform. We can set its position to the center of the node and rotate it so it's pointing up, make sure that it's scaled properly, and then let's apply that danger zone material that we're gonna set inside the editor. Let's also instantiate our text mesh pro visual. We can write our danger score right there into the text. And again, we can set its parent to be this transform. Now we're just about ready to test, but let's create an awake method that'll put all this together. We need to initialize our grid, we need to calculate all the sector data, and then we finally draw the grid. Let's go have a look. So here in my little scene, I've added an empty game object and I put the grid manager script onto it. I made the grid a little bit bigger, 40 by 40, and added my prefabs for my TextMesh Pro and for my material for Danger Zone. If we press play now, we'll see all the danger areas have a red quad in them, and we can see the values for how dangerous each of these areas actually is. Now the tank has a really long range, so that's why we've got that gauntlet running all the way up to the player. But if we come in here closer to where the soldiers are that have a shorter range, you'll see the numbers start to get more and more dangerous as all of their lines of fire start to intersect. So right in front of the tank, we can see the values go as high as eight, and we could probably make them go even higher if we moved the soldiers closer or increased their range. So now we can write our algorithm to allow the player to move to their destination while exposing themselves to the least amount of danger. To make this easy, let's add a public method to our grid manager that'll let us get a node for any world position. We'll just pass in a vector three, figure out what the X and the Z are based on the cell size, and we'll return that node. Now our tactical pathfinder is gonna be like an A star pathfinding algorithm, but with some extra considerations for how much time is actually spent exposed to enemy fire. To help us calculate that, let's have a public configurable member called danger penalty. 
I'm going to name our pathfinding method find tactical path. We'll pass in a start node and an end node. I've created a priority queue to represent the open list. This will be all the nodes we want to evaluate sorted by priority. Then we'll have a closed set. This can just be a hash set of all the nodes we've already evaluated. We can have a dictionary to track the path that's being taken, and we can have another dictionary that'll keep track of the G cost. We can initialize that with our start position having a G cost of zero. Then I'm going to have a special one here for exposure so far. I want to cumulatively track how long we've been exposed to danger. The more time we spend out in the open, the more likely it is we're going to get shot. So let's start by enqueuing our start node into the open list with a priority of zero. Then, just like in normal A star, we're going to evaluate everything in the open list. Let's dequeue the first node from the list, and let's check to see if it's our goal. If we've reached the end node, we're just going to reconstruct the path and send it back. We're going to do this last. We'll come back to reconstructing the path in a minute. Now, let's suppose it wasn't the end node. Then we want to add it into the closed set because we've evaluated it now, and we want to start looking at all of its neighbors. Let's create a really simple helper method for this that returns an ienumerable of nodes. We can define all of the directions we want to check, and we can just use link to do this. We can use a select statement so that we convert world positions to nodes, and we filter out all the unwalkable ones. Now, if we come back up into our loop, we're going to ignore any of the neighbors that are already in the closed set, and I want to carry over my exposure value based on how much exposure we've had so far in this path that we're exploring. We can use our grid manager to get the danger score for this particular neighbor. And then using all of these things together, we want to calculate a total cost. So the travel cost, the danger cost, and the cost of being exposed for a certain amount of time. I'll just scroll down so we have some room here. So our tactical cost, node to node, can first calculate our base movement cost. Then, if the danger score is greater than zero, I want to increase our cumulative exposure by our danger score multiplied by our extra penalty. On the other hand, I want to give a refund if the player's actually gone undercover. So if the danger score of that node is zero, let's take that cumulative exposure, and we're going to end up subtracting that from our path cost. We'll give it back to the player, and we'll set the cumulative exposure to be zero again. Finally, we're going to put all those things together. The travel time, the danger score, and any refund they get. So now we know the cost of stepping into this neighbor node. If it's not an improvement, meaning this new cost is not greater than or equal to the existing cost, let's just continue to the next neighbor. Otherwise, let's update the cost tracking, let's update the exposure tracking, and let's record the path taken. We can then use a heuristic to calculate the actual priority of what we think this neighbor is worth to get to the end node, and we can add it to our open list so that we can check its neighbors. The heuristic method can actually be fairly straightforward. We can have a base heuristic, which might be just a straight line distance. We can get the danger value of the target node. We can apply any penalty we want for dangerous areas, and then we combine those together and return them. This will help us evaluate nodes in a good priority sequence. Back up in our pathfinding method, if we actually made it out of here and we weren't able to return a path, let's log a message and return null. If I collapse up those methods to make some room, we can actually reconstruct our path now. This is the same as normal A star. Let's have a new list of nodes that'll be for our path, and we'll start right from the end node position. Now, as long as we're not at the start node, let's continue to add nodes into the path, and then we'll pull the next one out of our came from dictionary. Finally, let's make sure that we add the start node. We'll reverse the path and return it. Almost done, but I want to make one adjustment to our pathfinder. Here, where I was passing exposure in as a ref, instead I'm going to pass in a temp value. This way we're not accruing things just in case a neighbor doesn't get selected. Okay, let's make a simple agent that'll make use of this so we can test it out. Our agent script will be pretty straightforward. We need to reference the grid manager and the pathfinder. We also need to have some kind of destination. We'll keep a reference to the nav mesh agent and a list of waypoints that we want to walk through. Our current waypoint index can just default to zero. I'm also going to have a public method here so that my animator knows how fast we're moving. Now, let's create a method that will allow us to follow our custom path. If our waypoints are null or we've exceeded our count, then we've got nowhere to go. Let's make sure the nav mesh agent is stopped. We can reset its path and return out of here. Otherwise, let's make sure to set our destination to the next waypoint. If we don't have a path pending and we're within range of the next waypoint, let's just bump up our waypoint index. 
to be able to follow a path, we need to actually calculate and set our path. So let's call the grid manager to figure out which our start node is. Let's also figure out our end node. And those two nodes can be passed into our find tactical path method. Now we can say that as long as our count has more than zero waypoints, we can use the convert all method to put all of those positions into our waypoints list and make sure that our waypoint index is set to zero. If we come up here and create a start method, first of all, let's get a reference to our nav mesh agent, but also let's set our custom path. In update, we can follow our custom path. Let's go try it out. So on my player, I've added the tactical agent and the tactical pathfinder script and linked up all the references. If we give ourselves a good position to view, just check out where the destination is here. It's just a little bit ahead of the first soldier there. If I hit play, our agent should take as many cover positions as possible while working his way up to the destination. So far, so good. And now he's totally exposed, but there is no more cover to take. So that, in a nutshell, is the algorithm for reducing exposure to the enemy. And though we're not going to get into it today, you can use all of that sector information for better positioning of your agents and more tactical decisions than just evading enemy fire. But that's where we're going to stop for today. I really can't believe it's been 100 videos already, and I'm looking forward to the next 100. So if you've got a video request, make sure you head over to Discord and put it into the proper channel. Make sure that you like and subscribe because there's a new video every Sunday. I'll put another one of those videos up here on the screen. Maybe I'll see you there.